It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speaker's podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics when they stand at that podium. They speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Good afternoon, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 117th season of the Empire Club of Canada and today's live webcast. My name is Antoinette Tunilo. I'm the president of the Empire Club of Canada and your host for today's virtual event, webcasted from our home to yours. The topic today is managing through crisis and building a winning culture featuring Michael Medlong in conversation with Larissa Harrapin. I now call this meeting to order. Before we begin, Today, I have a few logistical items to let you know of. If you're finding your internet feed is slow, click the switch streams button below. There's also a request for help button available to you if you're experiencing technical difficulties. I want to take a moment to recognize our sponsors who generously support the Empire Club and make these events possible. Thank you to our event sponsor today, Social Bank, and our supporting sponsor, level five strategy. I also want to thank our season sponsors, Canadian Bankers Association and Waste Connections Canada. And thanks to our event partner, VDC Communications and LiveMeeting.ca, Canada's online event space for broadcasting today's event. Again, thank you for attending today's virtual webinar. I am truly honored to introduce today's speaker, Michael Medline, President and CEO of Empire and Sobeys Inc. Michael Medline is, Canadian, is a Canadian business leader recognized for spearheading historic transformative change at two of Canada's biggest retail companies. Joining the Empire team in 2017, Medline rallied Empire's workforce behind his sweeping vision to revive the retailer and executed one of the most effective turnaround strategies in Canadian retail history. His successful three-year plan restored the company's brand and earnings, creating a deeper connection with customers and the communities and empowered its business leaders to drive innovation and growth. In 2018, Michael was named CEO of the year by the Globe and Mail. Today, Michael will be speaking to us on the incredibly timely topic of managing through crisis and building a winning culture. With Sobeys Inc. transforming into an essential services overnight, we can all learn a tremendous amount from Michael. Michael not only acted quickly to steer his teammates to a challenging period to emerge as a leader during the biggest crisis ever faced by a food retailer, but it but he also helped position the company to keep pace with the rapid acceleration of retail in this new era. Joined alongside Larissa Harrapin, a seasoned journalist with Post Media, which includes National Post and Financial Post, we are sure to see a very dynamic conversation unfold. Following this session, we will be welcoming all of you to participate in the Q&A with Michael. So take advantage of the question box to the right of your screen. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Michael Medline and Larissa Harrington. Antoinette, thank you kindly. Hi, Michael, how are you? I'm doing great and thank you, Larissa. And thank you for everyone being on the line today. I know you have a lot of stuff to do, so I'm, I'm very happy you tuned in. 
The uh, Empire Club has introduced something new this year. If you talk over me and I talk over you, they're going to mute us. <laughs> um, in keeping with uh, these debate formats uh, south of the border, um, we wanted to distill this conversation into a few topics. Let's talk about the uh, impact of COVID-19, um, your relationships with the suppliers, uh, sustainability, um, the federal government, of course, introducing a ban on plastics, the future of retail. Michael, do we need bricks and mortar? And of course, uh, the, the future of retail in Canada. We're also curious to get your take on Canada's economic recovery. Um, Michael, are you following what's going on south of the border? Yeah, unfortunately I am. I'm, um, I got a lot of nervous friends who call me every night and wondering what's going on. So I, I think it'll be good at six days from now when, when we, 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 or hopefully we'll, we'll know what happened down there. Does it ultimately impact your business at all in any way? Um, I don't think so. Uh, our business, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it can impact Canada and I think it can impact our economy, which would impact us, but us particularly, not at all. Um, there is a word that has been used and perhaps overused in the last uh, eight months to describe what has happened in the last eight months, and that is unprecedented. Yeah. How have you managed to navigate during this unprecedented time? Yeah, you know, you, you, you can prepare all you want. You can do all the simulations of crisis you want. You're not going to be able to pre prepare yourself for this. And it's, you know, I have to, I have to think back uh, seven, eight months ago now and, and what it was like. And it is, it was a blur. It was absolute blur. We were moving as quickly as we could. And the only way to get through this was to get back to basics and a few key priorities. And we got it down, we distilled it down to three priorities. Keep the stores open, keep those uh, shelves stocked, keep our teammates and customers safe and give back to the communities in terms of philanthropy. And that's what we did during that period of time. And we stayed true to our values and throughout that time. And that's how you have to act. And so um, our team, um, including me, we worked around the clock uh, from wherever we were. And the team did a great job. But you got to think back. There are no cars on the road. There's almost no retail open. It's, it's, it's grocery stores, liquor stores, and pharmacies. Um, and we just had such a duty. We don't necessarily think of ourselves as essential services. For a number of months there, we were an essential service. We had to keep people safe and we had to keep them fed. And we didn't know where this was going. Uh, it was a very, very uh, scary time and indeed unprecedented. Um, it really brought to the forefront Canada's manufacturing. You saw breweries making hand sanitizers. Um, you saw auto parts companies making ventilators. Uh, we saw winter parka companies now pivoting, making gowns and PPE equipment. Um, it brought into question supply chains. And I am wondering, do we have strong food supply chains? Uh, we, uh, well, I think this proved that we do have strong food supply chains. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I like to be transparent. It was hanging by a thread back in March and April. Um, and uh, we were being asked to run our stores, run our supply chains at, at a level we didn't actually think was possible. Our great supplier partners um, uh, throughout the country were doing things they never thought were possible. And then, and then people who supply had to do that too. Um, it was hanging by a thread. We made it through because we worked together, because we innovated um, and we partnered across the country. Everyone was helping each other. We were in constant communication with our supplier partners. Um, uh, someone had uh, medium eggs, but not large eggs because they also supply restaurants, which were now closed. We'll take the medium eggs. We'll help you out. We'll help our customers out. Um, and uh, you know, this isn't just Empire, uh, the grocery industry, all the CPG companies, um, their providers, the farmers across the country, kudos. Uh, we held it together because we worked together. Shows you what a great country we have. I want to go back to something that you had just mentioned, um, realizing that now grocery was an essential service. Um, 
grocery stores had come together, I, I want to say, in, in a matter of sorts, and introduced a pay increase for frontline workers, hero pay, if yep. you will call it. Um, it highlighted perhaps what we had needed um, but it had also highlighted perhaps a, a, a lapse in the sector. Um, in the summertime, yourself and uh, two other Canadian grocers were uh, called to testify before a parliamentary standing committee. Um, indulge me here for a moment. Um, the reports seem to be that Loblaw and Metro had raised eyebrows. Do you feel that you were unfairly penalized but how, by how it all went down? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, and I think not only Empire, but I think that those two grocers were unfairly invaded against or uh, impugned. Um, we were doing everything possible to keep, to keep people safe, to treat our teammates uh, well. Um, the three grocers who you just mentioned, including us, um, put in, uh, in, in our case, a $100 million bonus plan to pay our heroes, because they are heroes. They came to work in the dark. They came to work not knowing what's going to happen. They came to work um, when no one else was going to come to work. Um, and we recognize that. Um, when, when uh, and by the way, these three grocers were the ones who kept, who paid hero pay. Some didn't. Kept it in the longest. Um, and, uh, and, and it was richer in terms of hero pig. Then when the economies opened up um, and everyone came back to work and all the retailers are open, uh, we phased it out. We kept it around for a while and then we phased it out. And so I think that we did the right thing. I think in North America, you'll see that, um, that we at Empire and others that you just mentioned um, did, a, did a great job um, and led the way. And so it was, um, it was somewhat noxious um, that that we were called on the carpet, um, but I understand these things. It's it's you know it's politics. It's it's uh, PR. Um, but um, I, I really I really think that we did a great job, and and we've also uh, we've also said that we would uh, put in an employee discount um, this month. We're putting in a ten percent discount for all our uh, our teammates in the stores and across our uh, supply chain. We are, um, if, if COVID rears its ugly head, in, like in March and April, we go to lockdown, we'll put back in something that looks a lot like hero pay. So I'm proud of what we did. I'm proud of what the industry did. Uh, but you know, you always, yeah, you know, we, we can take it. We can take questions and we should be able to answer them. And you know, I, you know, when we were called in front of the parliamentary inquiry, you know, there were some showboaters, but I would say that most of the uh, MPs really, really care about Canadians. They cared about our teammates. There was a guy, um, Brian Mass, and I think he's the MP for uh, the NDP uh, MP for uh, Windsor West. Uh, he asked us tough questions, but I could tell he cared about people. And I don't care about getting tough questions. I just, I, I, if you care. So yeah, it was probably unfair, but so what? Uh, we answered the questions. I hear uh, you mentioning that if we go into a second lockdown, that you will implement some new measures. And I'm just wondering, what is it uh, that you learned from the first time around because all the numbers now point to the fact that we are in a second wave. What did you learn from the first time? What would you do differently this time around? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to sound like a certain politician I, I, who says I, would, I didn't learn anything. I, we did learn a lot. And um, we, um, look, look, this was all new. We were inventing it. We were the first to put in plexiglass in North America. Why? Because we were benchmarking across the world and we talked to an Italian retailer who had tried plexiglass and we put it across our network in three weeks. Um, the industry, and that, and, well, now I can't go anywhere without seeing plexiglass. It must be a great business. Um, but I, well, it was inventing things and innovating and figuring out on the fly what the safest way to treat people uh, was. And I'd say that um, we're ready. We always thought there would be a second wave, maybe a third wave, whatever. And our viewpoint was, why don't we just prepare for it and never take our protocols down? And so we haven't loosened our protocols. They're strong now as they ever were. We're ready. Our real worry now, to quote Game of Thrones, is that winter is coming. 
Winter is coming. It could be very bad. We have to keep people safe and we have to be able to uh, allow them to come in and get the food. Um, we are looking at innovations in our stores. Um, it's going to be cold. We don't want people uh, lining up at the outside, but we want it safe. So we're going to uh, do some structural changes to our vestibules to allow that. Where that doesn't work, we're going to put in structures so that people are protected from the elements where they need to be. We are now uh, about to pilot um, some innovative technology for queuing, that if it's cold out or it's snowing out or it's sleeting out, uh, we'll let you know. You can sit in your car and stay warm, stay out of the elements. We'll let you know when you want to come in, when you can come in. And, so, and at certain locations, we're going to be able to do that. Um, so we're always innovating and getting ready. And we're also ready in terms of supply chain, working with our great supplier partners and getting ready for that. I heard you say just a short time ago, kudos to the farmers. And that lends itself to our second topic with respect to the relationship between retailers and suppliers. Michael, how important is that relationship between yourself and the supplier? Well, we saw, didn't we, that uh, how important it was. When it was put under the microscope, under the heat of the pandemic, we saw what it was like when we work for the national good, when we innovate together, when we move with velocity. I love the word velocity, you gotta move fast. Um, we became partners. We were in constant communication. I was, our whole team was, how do we get products um, to our customers? How do we make sure those shelves stay stocked? We were communicating, communicating and it showed us what life could be like um, when we work together. And look, we're, we're, we're joined at the hip. The, the, the whole food supply chain has to work in this country. You know, the farmers do such a great job. The transportation companies, the unsung heroes who, who bring uh, who, the truckers are, uh, we talk a lot about the stores. What about the people who work in the distribution centers and then our great supplier partners who, who really save the day uh, for this country. There seems to be a standoff happening. Um, recent reports have indicated that some of your competitors, uh, Walmart and Loblaw, have been or want to impose fees on suppliers. Your thoughts on these complaints from suppliers that are feeling bullied by these grocery stores? Yeah, well, let me take a step back and I'll, but I'll answer your question. Look, this is the worst relationship I've ever seen in my couple of decades in retail. Um, I was in hard goods or general merchandise, uh, Canadian Tire, Sport Check and Marks. I, uh, and, and in soft goods. And I wasn't used to coming into grocery and seeing the kind of um, relationship that went on between supplier partners and uh, the retailers. And, it, I, and I didn't think it was healthy and I'm, I'm, I've been quite clear in the past that I don't think it's healthy. Um, some of the practices like the ones you just mentioned that have been in the news uh, right now are for me hard to believe and, and, and repugnant actually. Um, and taken to the extreme, uh, some of these behaviors are just plain bad for Canada. And that's our view at Empire. They're bad for the consumer goods companies and for clear reasons. Um, they, they, they feel bullied, um, doesn't seem fair. That in turn hurts our farmers who we have to take care of. Um, it's not good for small mom and pop um, uh, food retailers. How can they compete with that? It's, it's terrible for consumers when things like this happen because the fear is that it's gonna raise prices for consumers, which we've been resisting uh, with all our might. And it's even unfair, well, don't cry for us, but it's even unfair to large grocers like us who try to play by the rules, who try to play fairly and want a good supply, uh, food supply chain. You know, um, when this doesn't work and, can't, and, in, and often in Canada it doesn't work, it discourages innovation um, in terms of products, um, it hollows out our country in terms of head offices for CPG companies and jobs. Um, and it's just not right. Um, now, let me, let me, I, I'd like to look at things in a balanced way. It can cut both ways. When I joined Empire, we were being gored by um, CPG companies, some of them. We were taken advantage of because we weren't a national company. We didn't have our act together and we were getting taken advantage of. So we have to have a pl level playing field, but we'll do it the right way. Um, and sometimes I got to admit, say PG companies complain to me or to us about what is plain good old fashioned negotiation. That's, you know, that works. But some of what we're seeing right now, what's in the news, come on, come on. 
Michael, ultimately, where does that leave Sobeys? What is your position? Will you follow suit? Um, good question, and we've been talking about it a lot. And, um, and I think I owe you an answer, which is uh, no, we won't follow suit. Um, um, we negotiate and communicate and discuss things um, with our partners, the supplier partners. This industry, as I just said, depends on that. Um, sometimes the supplier partners aren't going to like what they hear. Sometimes we won't. But um, across the board, uh, goring of each other, it does not work. And so we will we will take care of our ourselves and we'll take care of our shareholders, but we'll do it in the right way. Ultimately, Michael, this is part of a bigger conversation, which is the suggestions that government should be stepping in to regulate this sector. You know the examples from Britain, you know the examples from Australia, although Australia is more voluntary. Um, would that help to level the playing field? Yeah, this is a tough one, but um, you know what? Um, yeah, um, I don't think a government unilaterally coming in and putting in legislation will probably help because it's very complex industry and I don't want unintended consequences. Um, we at Empire are open to a code, a code like the UK, but tailored to Canada. We're open to it now. I, 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 you know, I wasn't totally keen on it a couple of years ago. As I've seen us go through the pandemic and I've seen some of the things that have to happen in this country, we're open to it. As long as it's based on a value of fair dealing, that it's simple and short like the UK code, uh, the industry can fix this. We can work together to solve it. But you know, two, pr two provisos. It's got to apply to everyone. Um, you can't, you know, it's, it's got to be fair. And it has to cut both ways. I expect too, that there's certain uh, suppliers need to also promise to play fair and there could be a few rules that apply to them too. But I think it's time. I think it's time that we got together as an industry and had a set of very simple value driven ground rules so that we don't get in this mess and that we have a very healthy food supply chain. I think we can do it. Um, most recently, the federal government uh, did step in and um, they announced a ban on single use plastics. That leads into our third topic on sustainability. Um, but as you had just mentioned, there are always unintended consequences. Michael, what are the unintended consequences here of the government's decision to try to reach this goal of zero plastic waste by 2030. Well, there's, I don't know if it's unintended consequences in this, in this sense, because I, I, I got to say, in this case, I completely applaud um, the government. I, um, I, I think it's high time that we uh, took a hard look at our use of um, single use and problematic plastics. I think the issue that's really bothering me right now, as I look at it, is, is this fact that you know, about 10% of what we, you know, all of us in Canada, we work hard and we clean everything off and we rinse it off and we put it in our blue boxes. And, and then to hear that 10% of it gets recycled um, is very problematic to me, that the infrastructure to recycle is not there. So we have to do two things. We have to get rid of plastics that, don't, that we don't need, and we can do that. And we can do that over a proper time period, working together with the CPG companies, um, we can do it, um, especially if there's clear code. Um, and we have to invest in, in more recycling. You know, we, we took a, um, a leadership role in this. Um, what the government's asking for by the end of 2021, what they're proposing is, is, not, is not that difficult in most cases. We're already moving toward that. Um, we are getting rid of all the plastic bags, uh, the checkout bags across the country. We've already done that in all of our Sobeys banners. We've done it in Quebec and all of our IGA, and we've done it all through Atlantic Canada and all of our banners. Um, customers love it. They like to do the right thing for the planet. We had teammates and customers asking us to do it. It isn't that difficult. Um, and on many of the things that the government is suggesting, we would do anyway. Um, and I think it's good that they're urging people to do it, and I, I think we should. Uh, again, the industry can fix this. We can, uh, we can create a safer planet. The only thing I would say is you got to always remember, and this is an unintended consequence, we got to make sure we don't increase food waste. That's a big issue as well. And we have to keep people safe. Food safety is paramount. So within those parameters, we can do a lot to really improve the environment and 
And, you know, um, uh, despite what I said about legislation before, kudos to the government to push us in this direction. But Michael, I'm wondering how realistic is it, given that we're in this COVID crisis and single use items have been so prevalent now, how how realistic is it to implement this kind of strategy? I don't want to say now, but given what we're going through, can businesses make this pivot or this change? It's going to require revolution, I think. Will it not? That's a great question, Larissa. And, you know, in the first number of months of the pandemic, you know, if you had asked us to do anything other than our three priorities, we would have just, we would have fallen down. Um, now, I think it's time, even during the pandemic, we have the protocols in place, we have the food supply chain in place, people are safe, we can't just use it as an excuse not to do things. Um, we have to be reasonable. I think in this case, by the end of 2021, what the government has urged and what was what, something we can do anyway, and we can do it during the pandemic and keep people safe. Um, it's it, but the more the government, uh, the, uh, the supply chain, including farmers, our supplier partners, the retailers work together on these. We all want the same thing. Um, we, you know, we, we, have to, we have to get rid of unnecessary plastic out of our system. And it isn't that difficult as long as we think it out correctly, that we're aligned and that the timelines are reasonable. We can do it. Michael, it seems like you have a lot of uh, foresight into the horizon. Um, I want to get into our fourth topic, which is the future of grocery retail. Do you think people are going to continue visiting these bricks and mortar stores? Um, uh, uh, yes, they will. Um, and for the, uh, I, I can tell you that we talk about e-commerce a lot and I love innovation and I love e-commerce and I'm only going to do one plug here. Voila, which we just introduced into the GTA is the best e-commerce. That's my plug for the day. Okay. I'm done. You you Good have time. the floor. You have the floor for one hour. Go ahead. Plug nah, away. I know, but I don't want to overdo it. This is the Empire Club. You know, I got to I got to respect that. So, um, yeah, but, you know, we fool ourselves to think. I had a question the other day. Someone asked me, they said, do you think like 50 percent of all foods being delivered through e-commerce? It's more like three percent, maybe four percent. So we were behind the developed world in e-commerce. Uh, Canada was um, before uh, COVID. Uh, we, it was only about, depending on how you measure it, let's say one and a half percent was yeah, food was e-commerce. During the heat of the pandemic, when, uh, when everyone was scared to go out, it went up to about four and a half percent, probably falling back to three, three and a half percent today. Um, part of the reason it's so small in Canada is we don't have great things like voila, and we don't have the infrastructure in place. But even when we do, we're, we're well behind the rest of the world which is running um, double digits in some cases, but for the foreseeable future, most grocery will be in bricks and mortar. E-commerce will be sexy. It will be the highest growth, but bricks and mortar will be what funds all this e-commerce growth. And it'll be the heart of uh, how people shop for a long time. Um, and so you have to balance. You have to be great in e-commerce and you have to be great in bricks and mortar. You have to be great in both, and that's what we're aiming to do. You took a huge gamble when you teamed up with uh, Okado, the uh, UK-based uh, e-commerce platform, of course, to help you launch Voila, the uh, online grocery service. Um, what has been the response to Voila? Yeah, um, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, I don't see it as a gamble. I didn't see it as a gamble because it was so it was such a great technology. It was the only time in my entire business career where it was something that, uh, like I lost a little sleep in case we didn't get it. And one of our competitors got the Ocado technology and we weren't able to have that exclusive um, use of it because it is so much better than everything else available and customers get it intuitively. So we've been open a few months now the response is the best I've ever seen in my career in retail. The customer net promoter scores are through the roof, the highest, even, even better than farm boy, just a little. And, um, and it, uh, even without a pandemic, it would have shone through. We'd be running at capacity. Um, it's just no substitutions delivery in that hour you want picked by robots. Um, very beautiful experience when, our teammates show up at your door and they're 
in their voila, uh, with the, the blue voila truck outside in their uniform, respecting every COVID protocol. Uh, it's just better. And so when you have the best mousetrap, you tend to win. So I didn't see it as a gamble. It's going, and I won't even say it's over. I think the net promoter score and how customers are getting it and receiving it's a bit better than I would have thought. Um, but it's, uh, it, 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 I never saw it as a gamble, but it was a big investment that we wanted but, to win and, and own e-commerce. But Michael, the timing of it, yeah. we're in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah, I wish we weren't, but yeah, it, it worked out okay for, for us. It, it's ramping us up quicker. People appreciate the robot pick more. Um, and, you know, uh, I really want to congratulate the team because, um, and we were still constructing as, as the pandemic hit. And to be able to stand up voila in the GTA uh, during um, almost impossible situation, um, the team uh, uh, of, of merchants and, and, and the people who worked on the construction and get everything set up, it was an incredible, almost impossible situation. You've described your operations as a startup. Um, now you're dealing with robots, automated uh, warehouses. Forgive me, are you out of your element here? I mean, now you're dealing with a software tech company, Michael. Yeah, I know. Well, that's what that's what innovation is. And, uh, you know, we have the most, it really helped us in the pandemic because in most places in the country, we have the most automated uh, distribution centers in, in, in Canada already. Then we have by far the most automated distribution center in the world um, in Vaughan, uh, supplying the GTA and, and much of southwestern Ontario. Um, and are we out of our element? No, um, <laughs> because uh, for years now, retail has become so technologically and innovation driven in some respects. Um, and so if you're not savvy at that, if you don't embrace it, you're a Luddite, uh, you're going to fail. And so, um, uh, but this tested everything. The, it's the technology from Ocado um, is the highest in, end in the world, the algorithms, the robots. Um, but, you know, um, they're, they're performing great. We haven't had an issue. So I guess ultimately, do you get the order right? Or do the robots get the order right? The robots so far have been um, outstanding. Um, they, they haven't made a mistake as far as I know. Um, and, uh, and when they get tired, they go and plug themselves in. You know, I, I do get the question sometimes, Larissa, with all these robots, are we going to have fewer um, people working? Um, right now, you know, we, we have uh, over 500 people working at a facility. It will soon be over 1,500 people. All the construction jobs, uh, this creates employment. Um, to, when you're at the vanguard of innovation, it creates opportunities and jobs. What does a win in e-commerce look like? Is this here to stay? What about post-pandemic? Are you expecting a drop in usage at all? Um, yeah, I think a temporary drop of usage, but a continuously higher rate of growth than any other uh, part of uh, retail. Um, we, it, is, it is shocking how low we were, as I said, compared to the rest of the world, like the UK, or the United States in terms of e-commerce e penetration uh, all over the map, but especially in, in food. Um, I think now people have, have checked out e-commerce uh, with us or, or our competitors and they see, and they figured it out. Um, and so it'll be part of how they shop. Very rare to have someone who just shops bricks and mortar, I think in the future, or someone who just shops e-commerce, it's gonna be a combination, but it will continue to accelerate far faster than any other part of the business. When you take a look at the future of retail in Canada, about um, five years ago, when you were at the Empire Club and you were at the helm of Canadian Tire, the, um, the, the, the title of that conversation was Innovate or Die, Competing mm -hmm. in a World of Digital Disruption. So I have to ask, are we where you thought we would be or where we should be. Yeah, almost five years ago to the day I said that, um, I still believe it. I think if you don't innovate, uh, you will die. Um, and, uh, and I'm a huge fan of innovation, as you can tell from this. And, and we have all sorts of plans that I, I'm not gonna make public today. But to be honest though, looking back five years ago, 
I'm, I'm disappointed in how little and surprised at how little progress um, retail has made in terms of innovation over a five-year period where I thought that, and many thought that it would explode. Other than data and personalization, where we, I think we've made some inroads as an industry and some checkout, like I admire Amazon Go and what they're doing in terms of, uh, you know, frictionless checkout and, and what we're doing in terms of our smart caper cart and that we're um, learning from and you're going to expand. It's in the Glen Abbey store now. Not much has gone on. Um, you know, store technology, um, we were way ahead at Sport Check uh, seven years ago than, than most people are today. Um, E-commerce, as I keep saying, is still a very much smaller portion of the business than I would have expected. I would have expected paper flyers to be replaced more readily by this time and almost on their way out. Um, I never thought it, but some people thought drones would be uh, delivering five years uh, from then, which would be today. Um, I never thought that, but it hasn't happened. But that doesn't, dis you know, that doesn't discourage me. I'm disappointed, but not discouraged. I think that uh, we must dream big and act boldly. We will do so at Empire. I expect other retailers will do so. Um, and, you know, and there are other things that you can do too. I mean, I think the more, I think today our customers are more cognizant of the brand and the value, the values of the retailer they shop. And they're looking to see, you know, do you believe in DE and I? Do you believe in sustainability? Do you sponsor the local teams? Um, do you give to uh, uh, charitable causes? So there's a lot going out on that was different than five years ago, but in terms of pure technology innovation, uh, it's slower than I would have thought. Um, I'm wondering whether or not a, a lot of, uh, I, I guess, retailers would say that the pandemic has accelerated uh, innovation and our ability to innovate. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I'd say that I, I differentiate between innovation, like like blow your socks off, you walk into a store and you've never seen anything like it, to our unbelievable ability as as human beings and and retailers to adapt, and and hats off um, to everyone in the retail industry. Like, at, at, you know, I got friends who who run Golf Town and, and Sporting Life, and I'm just thinking of them and how they had to figure out how to ramp up their e-commerce business and deliver curbside. And, and, and it was incredible. And, and my competitors in grocery, you know, um, uh, it, it, you know, even the ones that give a rough time sometimes too, um, and the smaller ones and the medium ones, um, how they adapted to help Canadians and help customers. So I think there's a, I, I'm so impressed with that, how people went out of their way and probably lost money actually, adapting just to serve their customers um, but I differentiate that from true innovation. Michael, we are approaching uh, the end of uh, our conversation. Um, the, the final topic on the agenda is Canada's economic recovery. Um, for all intents and purposes, you are the new kid on the block. You came in in 2017. Um, does the model need modernization? When you take a look at the existing culture and practices, does the model need to be changed? Which model are you referring to? The grocery model, the grocery sector. I think that, um, I think the grocery sector and the whole food supply chain showed us throughout the pandemic that it is um, nimble, uh, that it cares for customers, um, and that the where it has to change is our relationships. We can make this a better experience for our customers and for ourselves by working more closely with farmers, with our supplier partners. Um, I do think that we have to innovate and keep it exciting for our customers, but I do not think there's anything wrong at the heart of it with this model. I think we have people, who, uh, I think we have a great structure. I think we have people who um, obviously will work around the clock for Canadians. I'm proud of the whole industry for the most part. There is a concern by Canadians that grocery prices will rise and obviously with the impact of inflation. What does that picture ultimately look like? What can you tell us? Well, I, we, don't, we don't like it. We don't like prices uh, rising. Um, we fight them at every turn. At the same time, once again, if, if prices rise um, uh, to our, uh, our suppliers, um, we have to listen to them and we have to figure out why. If tariffs go up from the United States, if, um, 
if the cost of, uh, uh, of the supplies go up we, or the Canadian dollar falls, we have to hear and take care uh, to make sure we're not hurting the industry. But the whole industry tries to keep prices low. Um, early on in the pandemic, there were huge, uh, huge pressures to raise prices. Um, the, for, uh, as a whole, the industry responded um, wonderfully and, did, and resisted that because a terrible thing for the industry would have been to be seen as gouging or raising prices when Canadians needed us most. We didn't do that at Empire, and for the most part, I didn't see that across the country. Um, but we have to be um, we have to be watchful of it, and we will face inflation at some at some points, um, and hopefully it will be mild inflation. The uh, Bank of Canada making an announcement today that they will be holding on to those interest rates for quite some time. Tiff Macklem saying 2022, 2023. When you take a look at Canada's economic recovery on the whole, not just specific to the grocery sector. What keeps you up at night? Um, I think um, what keeps me up at night uh, are, are, is really safety and health of our teammates and, and customers is, is really at the end of the day, what worries me the most. Um, I, 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 that everything else can, can go on and I can be bothered by things. I, I worry about the economy and the dislocation to so many people. Um, uh, and, but I believe that the, our, our, our federal and provincial governments, the stimulus uh, uh, that they put into the system in a time of massive economic upheaval uh, has saved us at this point. Um, I worry about, um, and I know, you know, people think that um, uh, the grocers, you know, that we, we do better when these restaurants are closed and we probably do it on the margins. Um, but I am worried about the neighborhood restaurant. I, I, um, I've been ordering in um, constantly from my favorite restaurants. Everyone out there, I, I can't plead with you enough. We gotta support uh, small business. We have to support the places we've always frequented it, um, support them more than ever. I'm doing it um, and I think we all have to do it. Um, it can't just be government, we have to keep it going. And when I see stores closing, when I see businesses closing and I see restaurants closing, it's heartbreaking. And so, although, you know, we're getting through this as Canadians, like what's impressed me the most? Canadians. How, you know, firefighters dropped off donuts at our stores during the heat of the pandemic and people wrote chalk signs thanking our teammates, our heroes in the stores. But now we have to make sure that, you know, that we, we have this infusion, households are in good shape, we probably lost two, two and a half years worth of economic growth, but we'll get through this. But we got to get through, get through it together. But I am worried about these people who are suffering, who are unemployed, who are underemployed, who businesses are, are falling. Um, right now, governments are really helping to prop up our economy. We got to do our best too. Very worrisome about that, uh, worried about that. I want to bring in some uh, questions as you and I have been having this conversation. Uh, a question from Christopher. What is your brand strategy on private label? How do you compete with the likes of Loblaw PC? How they have their own brand? Yeah, well, we, yeah, that's a great question. And thank you so much for the question. I appreciate it. It's something we've been spending a huge amount of time in the last month on and over the last couple of years uh, with our executive team and our board. Um, uh, private label is becoming increasingly important uh, it, it becomes even more important in times of, uh, of, of economic uncertainty or any uncertainty. Um, we, over the last year, have made great strides. Uh, we've always had great um, quality in our compliments and now, and also our, 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 our great Panache uh, brand. But compliments has grown its market share over the past 15 months, as opposed to every other grocery in the country from things we've been doing. During the pandemic, we grew the fastest in terms of private label, and uh, you you ain't seen nothing yet. Our team has much planned in terms of uh, being able to uh, give our customers the best uh, private label experience um, where customers want it. We're not just going to shove it down people's throats, so to speak. Um, we've done a lot of customer studies where customers want to see more private label. Sometimes where they want to see less, they want to have national brands. Um, but this is a key priority for us going forward in our new project horizon, our next three years. 
a, uh, another, another question from uh, Mark, um, who is focusing on Voila and how you had uh, expedited, the, expedited the launch of Voila. Um, now, I believe, Michael, you had touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, what, what do you think would be some of the headwinds for Voila? Um, well, uh, headwinds are just time. That, that to put in the best uh, um, uh, to put in the best e-commerce solution, um, you have to build a state-of-the-art facility and put in the state-of-the-art technology and robots and staff it up with the greatest people. Um, and so it's just time that, that there's no cheating the system. Um, it took us uh, from the time we first uh, realized we could be the exclusive partner of Ocado. It took us three years to put up our first CFC. Uh, which is our big customer fulfillment center. Um, we have, very soon we'll have one up in Montreal. Uh, we've announced that we're going to put two more up. I think you can look west for those. I don't want to give it away, but you can probably look west. Um, so it's just time. Um, but the headwinds, there's more tailwinds than anything else. Um, uh, and it's and I would say the only uh, headwind is that we will have more choice of product in, uh, in Voila than even any grocery store. But because of the pandemic and people, uh, supplier partners having to cut back on the number of SKUs, that holds us back slightly. But we're over 16,000 uh, products already available in Voila, and we want to get that up to 39,000 uh, products. Uh, I want to bring in a question here from Barbara who asks, how did you communicate with your employees to keep morale high? And how did you build a strong culture throughout the pandemic? Michael, I mean, that's a, that's a tough one, tough one to navigate, keeping morale up. Oh my goodness. And, you know, I've been thinking that for four years, I, you know, I came in empire and morale was low because we weren't doing so well. Now morale is, was flying high and we hit this COVID thing and, and it, it was tough, but we had, you know, fortunately we'd already done everything to have the best team in place and the best processes and disciplines in place really helped us. But, you know, how do you, how do you, um, people who are coming to work every day are teammates. And what it is, it comes down to transparency and, and communicate, communicate all the time. Um, sending notes, sending encouragement, um, sending videos to people, uh, communicating with everyone. Now, one of the hardest parts other than, you know, that people are, are sick and passing away from COVID, one of the hardest parts is not being able to be with people all the time. How do you keep a culture and values alive? How do you keep the momentum of morale alive? when you can't see people as much, that I couldn't go into the stores as much in the heat of the pandemic, nor could my teammates. We didn't want to do anything to put anybody in harm's way. And so from the first day, you know, where it really, really hit March 8th, March 8th, it really, really hit. Yeah, it's been a big thing, how to keep people motivated. But you know what we learned? We learned they're already motivated, that we were motivated from our stores, that we have more of a store operational culture now, and that they're the ones bringing ideas to us. Ideas like how to um, uh, the customers uh, who have autism have trouble sometimes shopping in our grocery stores to have hours for them when they can shop. Seniors hours um, for shopping during the pandemic. Uh, those came from the stores. Those didn't come from me. Um, I, I, you know, it, I've got a great team of 127,000 teammates. They do it all. Um, and so that was one of the learnings. They're going to take care of their customers even, uh, even when we're not seeing them as much. Thank you. Uh, the final question, Michael, to you comes from Carter. Um, customers prior to COVID typically shopped at multiple stores to fulfill their weekly grocery needs. Um, obviously, since the pandemic, they've tried to minimize the number of stores that they frequent, obviously, for safety reasons. What are you going to do to maintain this level of loyalty post-COVID? Well, thanks, Carter. You ask a good question. It sounds like if, if, you, if you want a job at Empire, you sound like you're thinking the right way. So um, it's exactly the kind of questions we ask ourselves. So in, in the, uh, people were shopping mostly five different places for their food a month prior to COVID. Um, COVID hits, almost everyone shops one, just one. Now it's a little more than one if you looked at it today. So um, suddenly, and we, we grew our market share the most because I, I think for uh, people, uh, believe correctly that we are a very safe place to shop. How do we keep those customers? Well, now we, we have customers we haven't seen before. We have customers who are exploring our store and we were able to show them how great Sobe Safeway, IGA, uh, Farm Boy, Foodland, 
Fresco, I'm missing some, um, uh, are and 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 keep them. And 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 so our whole goal was show them how safe we are, but also thrill them with our private labels, thrill them with our our, our teammates in the stores. And we've been able to do that. So that is a super question and one that we thought about a lot um, uh, because we suddenly had this opportunity to thrill more customers. Michael, thank you, thank you kindly. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for your insight. I heard you say that Empire Sobeys has new initiatives. We're gonna be excited to hear about those around the corner. We, we thank you kindly for spending this time with us. And of course, a big thank you to the audience who has joined us. A thank you to the tech teams on all sides at the Empire Club at Empire Sobeys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Larissa, to you. And thank you to the Empire Club. What a great organization. And thank you all, thanks to everyone who tuned in today. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am now going to ask Jake Lawrence to uh, give the appreciation remarks. Great. Thanks, Antoinette. And thanks so much to Larissa and Michael for, for today's discussion. It was, uh, it was interesting. I took a couple learnings away and I'll also take a chance to plug Voila, which has been a great service my family has been using through the pandemic. Um, I've gotten to know Michael in recent years. He's a, a terrific leader, a real man of character, uh, and an outstanding retailer in Canada, as we've seen now at two companies. The length of my relationship with Michael uh, is not as long standing as the relationship between Scotia and Empire. Our two companies have a history that dates back almost 100 years when our firm first financed a bag of potatoes for Frank Sobeys. So we're really proud of that history. Uh, it continues with Michael today. The transformation that that company's undergone has been an impressive one through Project Sunshine and now Project Horizon, and we congratulate them on that. And the type of company and leader Michael is has really been on demonstration through this pandemic. High character individual, doing the right thing, looking after his employees, looking after his customers. So at the end of the day, Michael, thanks so much for all you've done for Canadians, for our families. You've been there when we've needed you most, your full team has. And on behalf of my colleagues at Scotiabank, thank everyone for joining us today. And I'll turn it back to Antoinette to close the program. Thank you, Jake. And uh, I just wanna add, um, that we have a Nation Builder Award. And I just wanted to mention that uh, that award is going to frontline workers. So Michael, your team's on our list. Um, you know, I have to tell you, when I went to the grocery stores in March, I would tear up when I would talk to the staff and I would say, how are you doing? And they would say, thank you for asking. Like I would just, my heart, like, I just felt like, how do you come to work every day and face us, all these different people coming through? You've got a huge job. You've been doing a great job. Thank you very much. Larissa, you are amazing. So thank you, the amazing Larissa Harrippin. It was a great job. Um, just want to tell you about our upcoming events. Um, we've got the election panel tonight, the U.S. election panel. Tomorrow, or sorry, Friday, we've got Lisa McLeod, the Honorable Lisa McLeod, Minister of Heritage and Sport, Tourism, and Culture Industries. And on November 3rd, we've got the Honorable Catherine McKenna, Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. We've got lots of events coming up in the month of November. So stay tuned, go on our website and please register. Thank you for joining us. And uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.